Hey there, welcome to the House Music Connection podcast. I am your host, Tony Fuel. Many of you probably don't know that I used to live in a little city called Spokane, Washington many years ago. I even had a short residency there at a little bar called Our Our Place, uh, and that was back in the 90s. Um, and Spokane is a little city of about, like I said, a, it's, or it's a little city of about 600,000 people that sprung up in the middle of a very agricultural area. Um, there's a lot of farming in, that, in the region, um, but uh, the city has not been the most fertile ground for growing and nurturing uh, any underground scenes, uh, especially house music or, or dance music. Um, you know, the city is about four hours uh, east of Seattle and five and a half hours east of Portland. And a lot of young people who are open to uh, bigger or different ideas than what is mainstream end up leaving Spokane for those bigger cities. I've, I've got a lot of family in Spokane that I visit once in a while. Somehow I came across uh, Dave Cassette on social media. I'm not sure exactly how I found him, uh, but I was stoked to find out that he is regularly throwing uh, house music parties in Spokane. Uh, and so I wanted to bring Dave onto this podcast because a lot of people might think that their city is too small to have a scene of any kind, especially when it comes to house music. But Dave has proof that with enough determination and a commitment to uh, staying true to the vibe, uh, that building a scene in a small city is possible, even a thriving scene. And thriving doesn't necessarily have to mean having thousands of people um you know, you can still have a steady, reliable, thriving scene with just, uh, you know, a few dozen people or a hundred people or so. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm excited for uh, Dave to tell us about that and uh, how he's really built a, a scene in a small city. Thank you for joining us. I'm excited for you to connect with Dave Cassette. Why don't we start with, uh, I guess, how did you get into house music and why, why house music still? Um, so I went to, uh, I guess technically my first thing I was always into like hardcore punk rock stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, the summer 1994, I went to see delight, like groove is in the heart. Mm -hmm. They were on tour. It was the first time I'd ever been at a venue where there wasn't a band on the stage. It was kind of really weird and foreign to me. Uh, there was just something about like, it was so different than like a hardcore show. There was no like mosh pit and people weren't doing front flips off the stage and people were mm-hmm. dancing yeah. and it was it like, I don't know. It was just, everybody was really friendly and nice. And I was like, this is, you know, pretty cool. And then, uh, that December, I actually went to my first like rave rave, like started at midnight till 8am. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it, back then it was all techno. Like I was really into techno, mm. like, Philadelphia was, you know, Nigel Richards and Josh Wink and hmm. Frankie Bones was in town all the time and Adam X and Joey Beltram. So like everything I went to was techno, techno, techno. And it wasn't until probably like the summer of 1995, we were down in Baltimore and we went into the, the little back room they had and it was Charles Feelgood. Like that's right. He had his little residency. Mm-hmm. And I remember like walk, they had like two big arch doorways and I remember walking in and like the air pressure was like pumping out of it. He was playing mm-hmm. like just like funky disco house. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, this is like, this is so different to what I'm used to. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's warmer. <clears throat> it's, it's just funky. It has like more soul. Right. And I think it was like at that moment, I remember my girlfriend at the time saying like, when did you become such a house head? Cause like every time we got in the car, I was listening to like, house, 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 house. Yeah. And it's just always been that way. I mean, I still listen to so many other different kinds of music. I still listen to like some punk rock stuff Mm -hmm. and I still listen to hip hop and even like heavy metal, but like house has been consistent in my life for 29 years. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just part of who I am at this point. It sounds like the, the vibe is kind of like what you (laughs) were initially kind of attracted to and it's kind of like kept you that kind of been the through line throughout the throughout the years yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, the warmth of it and the the funky and the soul and people just you know smiling and dancing and you know you go into the techno room and it would be not the same feeling it was Mm -hmm. a little bit more aggressive and 
people yeah. weren't dancing with each other. It almost felt more like a punk rock show sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember going to um, raves and with, with multiple rooms, and whenever there was like techno or like side trance or whatever, it was just like this is. Uh, I, I kind of do this in some ways, but but really, the my my heart and soul is really in house in house music. But I do like mm-hmm. other styles yeah. of music too. Yeah. Yeah, the hardcore rooms sometimes they would have was like way too aggressive. And too much, yeah. People were moshing and mm-hmm. acting like lunatics, and I was like, this is not for me. <laughs> right, yeah. For sure. So you grew up in Philly, mm-hmm. and you were there for a while, like a couple... 30, like, 35 years. Yeah, and so you were into the house yeah. music scene there, and the underground dance music scene, techno and house for what a good 15 years probably. 20 years uh, yeah 1994 until so i actually stopped djing uh i think 2005 was the last year that i played mm-hmm. um i had started playing in 1996 and then by 2005 I had four kids mortgage mm. two car payments and by that point the the rave act in 2001 had just completely just destroyed what the scene had been, I mean, it was getting to the point like, you know, there was a party in South Jersey that drew like 20,000 people. And at the time it was the biggest event on the East coast that had ever happened. And that was in 2000. And then a year later, the rave act went into effect and everybody was afraid to do an event Hmm. because they didn't want to go to jail. Right. And it just, it just died overnight. Parties went from 1500, 2000 people. You were struggling to see 60, 70 people. And the scene had become kind of polluted. There were so many promoters trying to all get a piece of everything. Right. And you'd have to yeah, well, calling police on other promoters to get their party mm-hmm. shut down. So those people would come to their party. So I just, I, having all the other life stuff going on, I was like, I don't have time. Right. So I just, well, I, I just remember also playing. around that time, like 2001, like, so I was living in Vegas, like 1999 to 2004. Mm-hmm. And so when I first moved to Vegas, all all of the clubs were playing like house music. I mean, more of that pop house, you know, like Madison Avenue and, you know, mm-hmm. Don't Call Me Baby and all that stuff. And, you know, of course, Stardust <laughs> and, and all that more, which is great music. Um, but um, and then all of a sudden, it seemed like within a six to 12 month period, everything turned from house music to hip hop in the clubs. And it was just uh, just a totally different world. I don't know. It was, mm-hmm. just, uh, it was this dramatic change, and then because so uh, so house was kind of like on the downswing, or any dance music really was on the downswing for 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 a while, while that uh, hip hop wave uh, kind of hit, and um, yeah, it's just it's so interesting how how the music cycles through, and yeah, mm-hmm. just well, <clears throat> I was watching a video clip of like Donald Glaud and Dan, two thousand seven, two thousand eight. There, everybody was playing electro house. Mm, yeah. like just hard electro house. And I remember yeah. I wasn't around at that time. I wasn't really paying attention to what was being played. And it, <clears throat> it actually wasn't until I moved here in 2011, I got out here and I never considered like, how do you make friends when you're 35 years old? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I don't know anybody out here. I didn't, I mean, I have two sisters that live here, but they're two hours away. They're not like right here. Yeah, and I was like, I don't know how you make friends, and uh, I was like, oh, I'll start DJing again. Like, super, you know, I'll pick mm-hmm. up a set of used twelve hundreds for five hundred dollars. Right. And then I realized that they had stopped making the twelve hundreds, and used ones were going for the price of new ones back in the day. Yeah. And I was like, what are these CDJ things? And I didn't like. I wasn't when I when I stopped playing Final Scratch, which is starting to kind of be a thing which mm-hmm. turned into tractor <clears throat> and um did you still have your record collection at that time or yeah. did, had you gotten rid of some of your yeah. records i had sold my 1200s i had just bought a brand new set in 2003 and i sold them in like 2004 yeah and but i know <clears throat> i kept all my records i still have them um but i sold like my mixer i sold anything that i had except because i was like that stuff's replaceable right but the records you know I could already see like the record stores were already starting to close even like when I was still like six eleven hung on for a couple of years after I stopped playing and then eventually they were just they were all gone. Yeah. So I'm glad I kept them because they're over there now against the wall, but 
you can't find them anymore. I mean, if you do, you have to go buy them used. And some of them, are, you go on like Discogs. Some of them are expensive. Yeah, and then they're shipping on like top used of that. Vinyl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. it's hard to always find them. Like in the U.S., they're always in like the Netherlands mm-hmm. or Italy or Germany, and shipping's like forty dollars for one record, and it's like, I'm good. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, like, I mean, yeah, the sound <coughs> quality is is great, um, and I, I like I love the tactile feel of the vinyl and everything, but mm-hmm. with I mean, you only get like one release for a fifty dollars yeah. purchase. I mean, even if you're buying something brand new on vinyl, it's still like you know, if it's like ten to fifteen dollars, you're only getting one release, unless they're doing like some kind of a pop, you know, a compilation that has like four singles, you know, from different artists uh, mm-hmm. on on that record or whatever. But yeah, uh, I have some records on the wall over there, and um, some of the younger kids when they come over, they look at them and it's like you know. Eleven ninety nine or twelve ninety nine, and there's only two songs on it. But I'm like, mm-hmm. I only bought it for the one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I don't, I didn't even want the other side of the record. I just bought it for this side. Right. So it's you know twelve dollars a track, plus the weight. I can't carry them anymore. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Carrying that flight case around all the time with eighty records in it. Mm-hmm. My back hurts just thinking about it. I just moved my records from one side of the room to the other, and I was mm. like, I'm so glad I don't have to do this anymore. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, yeah, we have it made today, and <laughs> I don't want to sound like yeah. one of those old fogies or whatever, but uh, kids these days. A USB stick and <laughs> headphones is all you need. Yeah, that's all you need. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, you, so you've been in Spokane since what, you said 2011 or so? Mm hmm. 2011. Yep. Yeah. And then how mm-hmm. long was it that you were in Spokane before you started, I guess, like, DJing again and then how did you get into starting your own parties so I was here a a little over a year I got Mm -hmm. here in August 2011 and it was right around Halloween the following year that I was like I'm going to start DJing again I found a guy on Craigslist selling these little I don't know if you would even call them CDJs they were made by Stanton but they were like their version of a CDJ it had a jog wheel and actually Mm -hmm. just they didn't have USB inputs. It was just CDs only. Mm. And it had it came with a little uh, two channel Vestax mixer and he sold them for like 300 bucks. So I was like, <clears throat> I don't know how this works, but I'm going to go. I met him at guitar center in the parking lot and I mm-hmm. brought him home and set him up and started burning CDs. And it was so weird, like putting CDs in and like you had out instant instinctively grab for the, the tone arm to like put the needle mm-hmm. down right. or like I would get done mixing and I would, turn around to go grab the next record because mm-hmm. I was just it was just like memory like muscle memory and I just kind of got the hang of it over the span of like I think I was only playing like two weeks and a friend of mine was like uh, he's a drum and bass DJ and he was like hey we're doing a, a party on Black Friday do you want to open and I was like I haven't played in like seven years and he's mm-hmm. like oh you'll be fine it's like riding a bike <laughs> mm-hmm. So I went and played. I'd never used Pioneer CDJs before. Mm-hmm. And I got up there and they turned the lights out and they were set in CDJ mode, not in vinyl mode, mm. which I had no understanding of even that was a thing. And I was trying to spin the platter backwards, but it was just, it wouldn't, it was just slowing it down. Mm-hmm. And I had like my phone out with my light trying to like read all the buttons on the CDJs and it was like yeah. panic mode. I had a minute and a half left on my first track mm-hmm. and I made it through, like I figured it out and then from there it was just like started playing i wasn't didn't have any intention of doing my own my own thing um was just doing um playing anywhere i could in spokane a lot of it was uh like all ages like rave parties and Mm -hmm. it was fine i got to play often and it kind of knocked the rust off and i didn't know a lot of the new genres that were out and then it was that was like 2013 i guess that was i was playing those all ages ones and then I think it was 2014 that summer I was like I kind of want to do like my own thing because I I would go on at these all ages things I'd go on after a trap DJ Mm. and I'd always look at the DJ a friend of mine and go how many songs before the floor clears because it would be like super ratchet like trap music and then I'd go on and start playing house and like one minute in the floor would clear yeah and then little by little people would no, yeah. they were, you know, they were all 16, 17, 18. Right. And 
<clears throat> they would start filtering back in slowly and mm-hmm. but I was like I think I could find the people who I, I didn't know the people here from the old days I, I actually did come out here and play in 2001 mm. um, someone booked me from Philly and I came out here for uh, just one night and I did mm. meet a handful of people that night and some of them were still around. Mm. And I was like, well, if they're around, there must be other people from like the nineties who are still around. Right. So I found this little burrito place downtown. That's a bar. And I talked to the lady who owns it and she was like, cause they do like spoken word and hip hop and bands play there. It's, it's really, really small. And she was like, yeah, you can have about the, uh, Labor Day weekend like that that Friday night and I was like okay and I had bought two speakers and I had mm-hmm. my own CDJs at that point and seven people showed up well mm. theoretically five it sure. was me and my girlfriend Katie and then five people yeah and then it's that was start. September yeah that was September and then yeah. I did the next one in November and like 12 people showed up and some of them were like Oh, I used to go to parties back in the nineties in Spokane and I didn't know anyone even still made this kind of music. I just, everybody just assumed it was just all EDM at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the main festival sound. And then, you know, I did the next one and like 23 people showed up and they would tell their friends and it just slowly built up. I mean, even now, like we've never had more than 200 people (laughs) at any of our events. I mean, it's a small town, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if anyone listening to this would really yeah. under, understands like this. That Spokane is really it's only what a half million people in the metro area, yeah. and then if you add Coeur d'Alene and it, you know its surrounding areas, it's like maybe seven hundred and fifty thousand people. Like yeah, it's like seven hundred thousand people. Area. Yeah, total. Yeah, and that's uh, two different states. Right. <laughs> and so, and it's also kind of got this um, like agricultural base and it's kind of conservative and, and whatnot. So it's not like a, it's not the same vibe as like Seattle or Portland or you no. know, anything like that. It's, it's, it's totally different. And so I, I think though that even over, even having over a hundred people, that's phenomenal for, for a place like Spokane. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think our most ever was like 165. Right. That's awesome. Which to me, I was, I was thrilled. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, um, so that must take a lot of determination and just fortitude and just sticking with it. Uh, tell us about like, tell, tell whoever's listening to the listeners, like, I don't know how kind of, how did you get from like, you know, five people or seven people to, to over a hundred people at your events in a small city? Uh, I think it's mostly just like word of mouth. I mm-hmm. mean, we don't, some of our events are public. Um, the majority of them are not public events. Like mm. they're, I wouldn't say they're full private events, like semi private. Um, and like, we don't, when we have public events, uh, I kind of miss the days of like putting flyers, like taking flyers out. Like I was a flyer nerd. I used to collect flyers. I still have a huge stack of flyers. Mm. Promoting today is a lot different. So <clears throat> I don't really promote, other than just like if we're doing a public event, maybe I'll buy like an ad on Facebook mm-hmm. or I just share the share the event on our Facebook page or our mm-hmm. Instagram or um, if it's private, it's all kept in a private Facebook group. And when we do our private events, we tell anyone who's in the group, like if you're in this group, you're invited mm-hmm. and you can bring one or two friends with you who are not part of that group. But if that person you bring acts like an asshole, mm-hmm. puts their hands on somebody, yeah. um, is disrespectful in any way, <clears throat> they're going to be asked to leave, but so is the person who brought them. Mm. So it kind of it makes people choose their friends a little more wisely, and they don't want to bring that guy with them right. like out of their friend group. So they bring people who are like super cool, and maybe they're not even really into house music that much, but like they show up and they're like this is like what I've been looking for. Like it's not even so much the music. It's the, the social part of it. Like it's, it's the you know, vibes, we have, the community. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's such a, we have, you know, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have all different walks of life, gay, straight, black, white, like, and everybody just, it's like the old days. Like everyone just mm-hmm. gets along together and just vibes on the dance floor and has a good time. And 
everybody's friendly to each other. I think in the last eight years, we've had to kick out two people. Hmm. And I mean, that's a pretty good ratio for, I think yeah. we've done at this point, 70, 77 different events at this point and two people being removed. I mean, that's, you can't ask for much better than that. I mean, on yeah, a local night down at the bar downtown, they probably kick out 10 times that in just one night. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. So I've seen um, on social media, your kind of like your dome set up in, in the summertime. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Can, can you t- tell me about that? So <clears throat> uh, it was, I was doing everything on my own. Uh, 2017, uh, I was doing a, a monthly event downtown. It was in an old bank vault. And uh, one of my friends, Jen, was like, oh, you got to meet my friend Josh. We went to high school together. He's been away for 20 years. He just moved back. And he DJs too. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, somebody new to meet. And started hanging out with him. And we became like best friends like immediately. And through talking to him, he was like, hey, my mom's got like, 80 acres like half an hour outside of town and i was like oh let's go check it out so we went out there in the spring once the snow melted and kind of walked through the property and we decided to buy one of those geodesic dome kits and Mm -hmm. we bought all the pvc pipe and i i bought the hub kit for that and my girlfriend katie did all the measurements and it was three different sizes of pvc pipe you had to cut and we put this whole thing together and we just we just threw a party out there and that th- I think we only did three that first summer. And then the next summer we did, we did like May, June, July, August, and September because it didn't have like a cover on it. So it wasn't weatherproof. So if it start, it, it doesn't really rain here in the summer at all. But mm. once September kind of rolls around, it starts cooling off and the rainy season moves in. So the, I think we did that for three years. And then we've been talking about doing like an upgrade, getting something a little bit more weatherproof and a little bit more solid and then COVID hit and uh during that whole we didn't do any party we did a party right before COVID happened in March of 2020 and then we didn't do another event for till May of 2021 it was like Mm. 15 months we didn't do anything at all yeah um but we took all that time we had off to build the new structure out there which is uh 30 by 50 and it's mm. got like a, it's got steel arches and it's fully covered in waterproof and weatherproof. And, and we built like a stage and we actually ran like Romex wiring through it and put outlets in everywhere. And, but it's still powered cool. by generators. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still like a renegade party. It's just a really well organized and like we've brought some people out there like Donald Glaude and mm. Jet X and, uh, rescue, uh, Brian, rest in peace. Uh, yeah. And they come out to this place in the middle of the woods and they just, they walk into this place and they're like, how did you guys build this in the middle of the woods? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like a, it's like a nightclub. But those are like, those are, that's where we keep like our, our, that's for like the private events. Yeah. So those are the ones it's like, yeah, you can come bring a friend or two, but just make sure they're cool. They're not disrespectful and they don't act like an idiot and everything will be fine. Yeah. And each time we get new, we, each time we get new people and then, Sometimes you see some of the people you haven't seen in a couple months. And then right. I keep saying one of these times we're going to get all of them at what they're all going to show up at one party and we're going to have like 500 people. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if that's ever actually going to happen. Yeah. That'd be awesome. That'd be amazing. Yeah, It would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. Just one time. Just one time. Yeah. So um, you talked about COVID um, and you started streaming or did you start streaming before COVID or did yeah. um and that kind of you kind of that was kind of like your pivoting <laughs> your pivot to yeah keeping the vibe, so, the vibe alive during the pandemic yeah so i had started streaming in 20 i think it was like 2018 um mm-hmm. there was a website called uh chew c-h-e-w dot tv it was a uk mm-hmm. based it was basically twitch just for d-days they yeah. didn't have copyright issues and we used to play on there every i think thursday night we were doing it and then Somebody hacked their server and they broadcast uh, like a football soccer game over their server and they got hit with like all the the fines for Mm -hmm. rebroadcasting. So it shut down. Mm -hmm. And then I had tried using Twitch, but it seemed really confusing because 
there wasn't really any DJs on it at the time. It was pretty much still just for video games. Mm-hmm. And then when when COVID <clears throat> when COVID came around, we were already we already had everything that we needed. Like we were already still kind of streaming on and off, but not regularly or anything. And then COVID happened, and we were all set up and ready to just to just start streaming where everybody else was trying to find audio cards and trying to find webcams and green screens and everything was sold out because mm-hmm. everybody was trying to buy this stuff. Yeah. And uh, my, my thing was because <clears throat> we used to always come over here to Josh's house to DJ and, and stream. And cause I had the computer to do it. I would bring my setup over here every week. And I remember I asked my friend, Jeremy, I said, is there a way that, like you can stream at your house and Josh can stream at his house, but it all comes into my house and it all goes out on our channel. So people don't have to keep changing channels. Like go to Josh. He had had Mm -hmm. to start his own channel and Jeremy would have to start his own channel. And within like two or three days, Jeremy's like, Oh, I got it figured out. And it was like an RMTP server thing. And he came over, he took remote, he took remote access to my computer and set it all up. Mm -hmm. So, I would text Josh. I could see him on my camera, on my computer, and be like, "Start playing," and it would come through on my channel, the Back to Basics channel. Nice. And then I would text him like, "Okay, like Jeremy's ready to go. Play your last track." And then I could fade out Josh's audio and bring in Jeremy. And now people do it all the time. Yeah. Like it's a pretty regular thing. But I, I'm nobody was doing it at the time. And I asked Jeremy this random question, and he had it solved in like less than probably like 24 hours, and we were up and running. So we, even during COVID, we could still all stream together. We could all still play. Mm-hmm. But it all just stayed on the one centralized Twitch channel, which right. was really nice because then people didn't have to like, oh, I need to go. I right. have to go raid this person's channel. Or yeah. Just just stay on here and you're good. But yeah, so we've been streaming for quite a while. Yeah, and I imagine that, that probably helped keep your community together, at least at that time when everyone was going through oh, this. Yeah. yeah. I was looking at our <clears throat> some of the the statistics on Twitch and like May of 2020 I think we we were having like 40 some thousand minutes of viewing time whereas now it's like you know you struggle to get like 8 or 9000 a month mm. but we were doing like five times that during cuz everybody was home yeah we got raided one time by some of the uh somebody was involved with Gabriel and Dresden and like sent us like over a hundred viewers, like immediately, like we had like, you know, 23 and all of a sudden we were at like 125 or something. Now it's like, you know, you struggle to hit 25 or 30, but you know, nobody's sitting in front of their computer 24 hours a day anymore either. Right. And they're coming out everybody's, to the live events. Yeah. Back yeah. outside again. Yeah. Cool. But I still like streaming. Streaming to me is really the only time I DJ. Hmm. Other than a live event, like I don't practice anymore. Yeah. So I always just took streaming as like this is an hour of practice, and if it doesn't work, if these two tracks don't sound good together, so what? Now yeah. I know. Do you DJ at your own parties? A lot of times, or uh, pretty much, much every time. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I usually play last. Um, hmm. Spokane's not a late night city. Yeah. We we've done when we first started doing the dome parties. There was a couple nights where we went till I played from like five a.m. to eight a.m. Like there were still people there, like mm-hmm. a handful. But by and large, by usually midnight, people start kind of filtering out, and then mm-hmm. by one, you kind of just got your regulars, yeah. like your hardcore regulars. So I, I always end up playing last. I wonder if some of that has to do with like our age now, because you know. <laughs> I, I, for one, am not not as young as I used to be, and I certainly don't move the way that I used to no. move. And yeah, no, it's, uh, it's I, I, I've played late, like not that long ago in 2018 when I went down to um, it was up near Tahoe in the mountains. Hmm. I played, and they put me on from 3:30 till 5:30, <laughs> and you know, flying down there and then driving up to there, like I was pretty worn out. <clears throat> And I ended up playing till six, like six fifteen, because the other DJ never showed up. Was supposed to play after me. I think he fell asleep. Hmm. And I hadn't done that in a long time. And I was like, I don't think I could do this all the time like I used to. Hmm. I mean, I used to come home in the nineties. I used to come home at you know eleven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember I I used to drive from because I grew up in Tacoma, 
And so I would drive, you know, my friends and I would drive from Tacoma to Portland. We'd go to this one place called the City Nightclub. And mm-hmm. we'd make that two-hour drive. And then we'd party until 4 a.m. And then we'd drive home yep. and mm-hmm. didn't even go to bed when we got back to this, you know, to Tacoma. No. We'd <laughs> Still hang out. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, yeah that's crazy. Uh, no, like the spring before I graduated, uh, like spring of 1995, we used to go. Um, there was a night in Baltimore. It was every other Thursday, mm-hmm. and it was from 10 till 4. Baltimore was about two hours away. Mm-hmm. And we would go down there and leave at like 4 in the morning and then drive home, get home right before school, and then go straight to school. Yeah, those were the <laughs> yeah, some crazy no days. Way do that. The thing yeah. is like, and I... um for that at that period in my life that it was all about the music for me because I didn't partake of any of the, you know, the party favors, if you will, um, mm-hmm. or, you mm-hmm. know, anything like that. And, and, and it was all about just the music and dancing and part, you know, having fun with the music and dancing. Mm-hmm. I can't say I never did any of the other stuff. <laughs> oh, well, well I, I did later. <laughs> But when I said, when I said, you know, these days when I was like driving to Portland and driving back the same day that, you know, as, as before I was 21 and Mm -hmm. I I didn't do any of that stuff until after that, but, uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't even start drinking beer until I was like 24, 25. Yeah. It was just never like, it just never interested me. Yeah. Those were the days. Crazy. Yeah to be young so have you uh so, you, so you're dj you throw events um you've built a scene in the community how um i guess you'd probably say that having a community is pretty important mm-hmm. yeah. oh 100 percent. yeah i mean yeah. that's i mean that's why we do it i mean yeah. it is fun for us to like you know book a dj that you're interested in or you know do a party and you know, be able to set up the sound system and play it really loud. And, but primarily it's just about like having this space where everyone can come hang out. And, you know, I've had people, you know, say like, Oh, my girlfriend said, this is like at all the places she's, she's ever been, this is the place that she's felt the safest hmm. because people know, like we don't tolerate like bullshit. Like if people, if someone starts acting like an idiot, like we'll pull them aside and be like, Hey, and, you know, we had a, you know, sometimes people, you know, maybe get a little too can't handle their whatever it is they took. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, the person personally, mm-hmm. you know, they're not an asshole, mm-hmm. but maybe they had a little too much and they're having a bad time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've had to tell people like, hey, baby, like sit the next one out. Yeah. <clears throat> like, I don't want to just be like instant, like you're just banned forever. Don't right. ever come back. If I don't know the person, that's a little different. Like, I don't know this. I don't know this guy and he's just, he's being a dick. Like, mm-hmm you're probably not coming back. But if, you know, I have a relationship with someone and, you know, they're getting a little, maybe a little loud or having a bad time. Maybe they took something and it's not agreeing with them. Mm -hmm. You can't really blame it on the person. So it's just like, I've told people like, hey, maybe skip the next event and come back the next time. Right. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. I think sometimes it's embarrassment because the next day they realize what happened. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, that regret of like, oh, I either drank a little too much or... I got a little out of control and right. sometimes I get apology. I get apology letters sometimes. Yeah. Which is cool. I mean, yeah. it shows that, you know, they really, they don't want to screw up what they had and right. lose out on this. And I was, you know, I always appreciate that. If someone sends me an apology letter. For sure. So have your, have your parties been kind of, um, do you have people mostly from Spokane that, that DJ or have you had some, some guests from like Seattle and Portland and, Mitchell Jed X as well. So yeah. Yeah. Jed's down in like the Bay Area. Um yeah. he comes up pretty much every I brought him up every our anniversaries in September. Mm. And I think he's played at like we just had our eighth one. I think he's been here five or six years in a row. Mm-hmm. Um we've had Donald Glaude a couple times. We've had DJ Dan a couple times. Um cool. We've had this last one in September, we had a couple DJs from Portland. Um we had a someone from uh, Walla Walla come up. That's about three hours south of here. Okay, down near the down near the Oregon border. Mm-hmm. Um, I've had some people from Missoula come over. Mm. That's probably 
I don't know if we've ever actually had, we've had one, I think one person come from Seattle. Seattle doesn't look fondly on Eastern Washington. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, that, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, they think all of Eastern Washington is like, you know, farmlands and hillbillies. Mm-hmm. And maybe at one point that was true. It's not right. like that anymore. Um, right. It's changed a lot. Like the city is, so many people are moving here. It's it's growing. Uh, last year, the fastest growing city in the country was Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which is 25 mm-hmm. miles away from here. Mm-hmm. And the seventh largest, the seventh fastest growing city was Spokane. Right. So it's it the demographic is changing. The city itself is changing. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't Seattle like I've never actually played in Seattle. Yeah. Like I've played in since I've moved here, I've played in Portland, Northern California, Southern California, uh, Phoenix, uh, Missoula a bunch of times, Boise a couple times. Um, Portland, I think I've only played once, but I've never even been asked to play in Seattle, which I always find kind of funny. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> they call it the Seattle freeze. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And I've actually heard that from, I mean, I'm from Seattle, the Seattle area, but it's been a long time since I've lived there. So, but I, I, mm-hmm. t- I talked to people today and, um, it's the same story for even people who live there a lot of times. Uh, oh yeah. It's, it's just a certain, it seems like, um, I mean, every city, Thinks that they're seen as clicky, as it's click. it's, but mm-hmm. um, I think that maybe that could be said about Seattle more than maybe some other places. So, well, yeah, <clears throat> even Jed Jed X, he lived in Seattle for a number of years, mm-hmm. and he said he couldn't he couldn't buy a gig there. Yeah. And I mean, that's even when he was like, you know, he was releasing music pretty regularly at the time, and mm-hmm. he's like, I couldn't I couldn't even get a job DJing anywhere. He's like, I barely ever played in the city when I lived there. Mm-hmm. And it seems like it's pretty it's pretty common. Like if you're not part of one of those specific cliques, mm-hmm. you're just not even considered. Which at this point, like I don't even try to get booked anywhere. Right. Um, mm-hmm. I think the last time I even played out of town was twenty. I think it was that time I went to Northern California, so twenty eighteen or seventeen, whatever that was. I used to like try to get. It was always fun to go check out another city for the weekend. Yeah, it's always cool to um, jam and vibe with other, you know, other scenes. Yeah, and like, yeah. Oh, like, oh, we're going away for the weekend. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, a lot of times my girlfriend would come with me and we would fly somewhere and hang out and mm-hmm. go out to eat and just check out a different city. And I just don't even try. Um, yeah. It just doesn't really inch- – I mean, I like I like to travel, mm-hmm. but as far as like the, hey, like try to book me and there's just so many DJs today. Mm-hmm. It's like unless you're doing something really – specific or unique i mean what makes you stand out from the ten thousand other djs that are out there just in that one little area like why would they want to book you right so i don't even try i i just mostly focus on our stuff here yeah um we have a a building that we're working on for our own so the shelter thing out in the woods obviously you can't use it in the winter time hmm. um it's in the woods and it gets snowy and the other issue was we were, you know, it's runoff generators, so it's not really ideal. <clears throat> so we have a building in town that we can use year round, and it, it's been over a year. It's got like a whole new roof and all new electric, and a lot of the rooms got gutted and the floors got redone. And Josh has been dumping just so much time and energy into this building, and um our friend Zach's been helping them and they added like more bathrooms and we had, there was asbestos in the ceiling. So this, when the roof got taken out, the, they had to pay for a company to come in and take all the asbestos out, mm. but it's almost done. It's going to be so nice having our own place. I'm not going to have to lug speakers around anymore. Right. So does that um, mean that the, the parties out in the woods are going to be done? Uh, everyone keeps asking that and it's like, I don't want to keep having to take the lights from somewhere else and the sound system and drag it all the way out into the woods and mm-hmm. set it all back up again. But there is something special about that place. So I'll, I'm like, say never say never. Right. But maybe it'll be just like a, a, a more low key version of it where we're not bringing out, you know, all four 18s and all four 15s and mm-hmm. the whole, the whole, the whole rig, maybe we'll just bring out, you know, two subwoofers and 
yeah. just two monitor, you know, two top speakers instead of bringing the whole rig out there. It just, it gets to be a lot. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> Lugging it all the way out there and then you got to bring it back into town and then everything gets dusty and dirty. And then I don't know. I said, we'll never say never, but right. I'd like to get away from it at least mm-hmm. on a regular basis. I think once a month started to get kind of aware. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so here, uh, kind of changing gears a little bit. So have you, uh, have you done very much production making it pumping out tracks? Um, no, I wouldn't say a lot. Uh, I have, I think only three tracks that have ever actually come out. Um, I have a, I did one with Jed a couple of years ago and I've done two with my friend, Brendan, who goes under the name so-and-so. Mm. Um, I have a hard time coming up with original ideas. Like it's hard for me to sit down and just create something out of nothing. Mm. So a lot of the tracks that I, the exception to that was the one that I did with Jed. It was something that I had made and sent to him mm-hmm. and just asked him for like some, you know, criticism about it. And he was like, send me the stems of these. I think I can actually do something with these. And like, he kind of put his take on it and that's the song that came out. Whereas the other ones were stuff that Brendan sent me and was like, Hey, do you want to remix this? Mm. Or, you know, here's just some stuff I've been working on. And then when I, when I approach it that way, as soon as I hear like what they already have in place, then I'm like, Oh, I can use like this little bit of this vocal here. I can Mm -hmm. chop that up. I can change the baseline on this and reconstruct it a little bit more. It's, it's easier for me to do it that way. Right. When I sit down and just open like Ableton and it's just a blank screen, I end up just like making like endless loops and Mm -hmm. then I get annoyed and just turn it off. Yeah. (laughs) I have like a hundred unfinished projects of just like loops that I'm just like, I'll never do anything with this stuff, Hmm. but it's easier for me to take something else and then kind of put my take on it and edit, remove, add, replace. Mm -hmm. And then that's, you know, it just, it just, I guess maybe that's how my brain works a little bit better. Yeah. I'm not super creative. Like I can't, I like, I can't paint. I don't play any instruments, Hmm. but I like doing parties and events and like I can take little pieces of this one and that one and yeah. plug in little different things and different lineups and different venues and it's easier that way, but yeah. Yeah. So you've been, you've been doing it for a while. Have, do you, do you have like a system kind of down as far as producing? No, as far as like uh, putting the events together and. and oh, uh, events. Um, the hardest part has been finding a venue. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of them in Spokane. And yeah. it seems like all the ones that we find that we really like and the owners really like us and we have a good relationship, they end up going out of business. Mm. That's, just, that's what's happened. Like three, I guess four of the places that we were using have all since gone away. Like our mm-hmm. favorite one was a place called the observatory. We were doing once a month. They were like, I had tried to get in there for a couple of years and I was always just like not even replied to in messages. And then I finally got someone to reply one time and they wanted to sit down and talk with us in person. Mm. And me and Josh went down and talked to them and I had already sent him an email ahead of time. And I was like, we are not EDM. Like Mm -hmm. I know you probably think when you hear like dance music, you're going to have like, girls in like bikinis and shirtless yeah. dudes and bros. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that, that is not us at all. Mm-hmm. I was like, our average age of people who come here is like 35. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so when we had the face to face meeting with him, he was like, I just want to tell you, he's like, your email addressed so many of my concerns, like yeah. right off the bat, that that's why I wanted to meet you guys in person. Mm-hmm. And we, we were there for, I think we were there once a month for a handful of months through the winter. And then in the summer we would go back out to our shelter thing. And then when we get called out, we'd come back into town again and try to find another venue. And then it was owned by like four people and they all had a falling out and the place Mm. closed. And then one of the owners decided to reopen it again by himself. And it lasted for maybe six to eight months and then it closed again, and that was the last. Now it's a it's a waffle place downtown, mm. which is kind of disappointing. Josh yeah. was actually in there not too long ago, and he's like, "It's so weird. I'm sitting eating waffles where the stage used to be." <laughs> yeah, it's kind of sad. It is. Yeah, it's so sad. I mean, there's like the industry in general. It's just like like that overall. Yep. Like with the oh just, yeah, 
things opening and closing so so quickly and then yeah mm-hmm. and then i find that in the little little city that i live in you know we, we're, we're like two hundred thousand people so we're like a third of the size of spokane and mm-hmm. um i don't know people are just a lot of the the restaurants are so um hesitant to do anything that's not like already being done at another place like a lot of them have live music where it's you know like a guitar player and you know somebody mm-hmm. you know maybe singer song usually, usually not even drums or anything it's just like you know mm-hmm. it's and, and i don't know people say the house sounds the same but some of the people that some of these live music acts that are like in the restaurants like that are different acts they, they, the they kind of sound the same, same, same as each yeah. other so mm-hmm. yeah yeah i don't know Ugh. Yeah, it's hard to convince people to try mm-hmm. something new. Um, yeah. Especially if they've tried something in the past and it didn't go well. Mm-hmm. Like some of the places are like, oh, we've done dance music nights and it was nothing but fights and Yeah. And it's like, yeah, because you're you're inviting like the college age crowd to it. Mm-hmm. Like there's a whole section downtown of Spokane. We call it the Bermuda Triangle because mm-hmm. it's like three or four bars on opposite corners and on weekend nights it's you know, it's just a sea of, you know. 21 year olds and mm-hmm. there's they actually have cops stationed down there because there's always fights and there's always somebody screaming at someone or there's you know there mm-hmm. actually has been a couple shootings lately and it's oh, just no. I, we just avoid that area completely like we yeah. just avoid the whole the whole edm scene in general completely like we don't associate it's you know i wouldn't say it's completely by choice but it kind of is like mm-hmm. they do their thing they want to cater to you know 18 23 year olds and you know rage and do all their stuff and we can do events on the exact same night and it, our people would never go to their events and their people probably wouldn't come to our events so like mm-hmm. it doesn't it's not like you have to worry about like date stomping right like oh we're doing the events the same night it doesn't matter our people our, our crowds are completely separate mm-hmm. and you know i said we're we're the old people right (laughs) that's the truth yeah yeah i'm i'm old so yeah i'm 47 and went to my first party when i was 18 so yeah it's been a long time it's been a while yeah Mm -hmm. well this has been a really good conversation so uh kind of uh, landing the plane if you will um what advice would you have for someone who is in a smaller city who that the who thinks that there's nothing happening and they want to like get, make something happen. What advice do you have for them? You just have to go try it. Like mm-hmm. you just have to do it. I mean, it's probably not going to go well. I mean, you'll probably end up with five people, you know, five of your friends are going to show up, but you have to start. I mean, mm-hmm. I was, you know, <clears throat> I kicked around the idea for about a year and started like, buying like i bought like you know two subwoofers and two speakers and i'd already had two cdjs and a kind of like a crappy mixer i bought like a a nexus mixer with the idea that at some point if i am going to do my own events i'd like to have at least i don't have to, i don't want to rent gear from somebody it's mm-hmm. just more money to come out of your pocket i'd rather have my own stuff and that's what i did and found a place that didn't charge me any money to do it and they were like, you know, we'll give you, I think it's like, you know, 10, 10% of the bar from the time that you guys, if you're, if you're here from, you know, 9 p.m. till 12 p.m., those three hours or 12 a.m., those three hours, we'll give you 10% of the bar tab, you know, whatever the bar made in those three hours. You know, most of these times I would you'd make like $50, $60, mm-hmm. but you got to start somewhere. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we have, like I said, there's so many people who, come to our events and have become like our hardcore regular supporters did not grow up listening to this music. Mm -hmm. had no idea this music ever existed. We're not ravers back in the nineties and just discovered it through other people. And now like, they're like, I love to dance to this stuff. Mm, Like it's just, it's fun. The people are great. The energy is great. The vibe is great but they didn't come from this. They discovered it when they were, you know, 42 years old. That's a really interesting perspective it's it's cool to hear that because i've always thought that okay the the house music scene it's it's as big as it's ever going to get because it everybody has already lived it and then there's not any like new fresh people coming into it and so mm-hmm. it's kind of going to be it's going to like you know 
kind of dwindled down over the years or whatever. So that's kind of been my mind, my, my mindset uh, mm-hmm. about it. But hearing that, that's, that's awesome. It, it, um, it just shows that like people are still attracted to the vibe and house has always been in, in the underground. People have to find house and, and be, uh, mm-hmm. they kind of have to stum- stumble upon it. And then when they do, it, it attracts the right, you know, the music and the vibe will attract the right people. And it's, it's, you know, it's easy to dance to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, you know, too. I've, I've played at like friends houses for like little get togethers and, you know, their family members are there and like, you know, they've never listened to anything like this. Mm-hmm. And a couple hours in, they're all dancing in the living room and I start going through all my stuff and I'm like, Oh, what has like a, like an 80 sample? Like, Oh, this one has Jane child or, mm. and then you start playing it or it has a Whitney Houston sample in it. And they're like singing along and like, they love it. And they're like, they leave and they're all sweaty, mm-hmm. <laughs> but they've, they've never ever gone to a nightclub and danced to like house music. And all of a sudden they leave and they're like, I love this stuff. Nice. So yeah, there's definitely people out there who don't know that they like it until they actually experience it, go yeah. out and experience it. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So I would just say just just start your own thing and give it a shot. Cool. Just don't invest a lot of money into it. Because <laughs> you're not going to make any money at it. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. if you have friends who have, you know, gear you could borrow or speakers yeah. you could borrow, or, but like don't go out and spend a ton of money or book some huge DJ for your first event. Like you're not, it's not, we've lost so much money compared to what we we've, we've put into it. Yeah. Well, it I've sounds like you kind of book. Like, took it, like started with the mindset that you were in it for the, from the long haul and that you were playing the long yeah. game rather than trying to see what it was, you know, experiment one or two times and then. Yeah. Well, I've booked DJs knowing I'm going to lose my ass, but yeah. I just wanted to do it. I mean, I said, it's only money. You go back, you make more and you try again the next time. But I've seen guys book artist or you know and then they book like a really expensive venue and then they they rent a huge sound system but they don't have the money to pay for it because they're thinking that they're going to get all these people through the door who are going to pay and it's like no you have to have the money before you start because that Mm -hmm. way if the party doesn't make any money you Mm -hmm. can still pay your djs your sound guy or whatever it is that you're renting the venue you can't rely on Oh, I'm I'm definitely going to get 100 people through the door tonight. No, you got to expect you're going to get five people. If and then if 60 people show up, you're you're thrilled. Mm-hmm. Totally. <laughs> yeah, don't aim real high, aim real low. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there any I don't know any parting words as we as we wrap up here? No, it was good to finally meet you though in person a couple yeah. weeks ago when you were out here. Yeah, it was... I think we've been talking on Facebook for freaking ages yeah so good so good to meet you and you're so hospitable and you know i can tell that you totally love the music and you're all about building a community so it's uh yeah it's been cool to and it took you to meet more people took like you to that. the new building and showed you around got to yeah give you a little sneak peek of what we're working on down there not a whole lot of people actually been in there yeah but man if you ever come back man hopefully i can yeah time my next visit play. to when you guys are having an, an event or a party yeah I said, if you give me a couple weeks notice, we can definitely try to put something together before you get out here. Cool. So where, um, if people are visiting Spokane or if they want to find out more about Dave Gazette, uh, what, how do they find out about you and what's the best way to, to follow you or to the, get information about you? The easiest way would just be to go to, uh, back to basics.live. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> That's B A C K two B A S I. Yes, ICS yeah. dot live that has um, from there you can find like the SoundCloud, the Instagram, Got it. the Facebook, Twitch. Like it has all the social media. You just click on it, it takes you right to those pages. Okay. Um, we're on Twitch. I've been playing on Twitch on Wednesday nights lately from seven to it's supposed to be eight, but it's usually like eight thirty, almost nine. And I'm, I'm not even like really mixing, I'm just playing. All the music that I've collected that's and it's between like nineteen ninety and two thousand. Mm. And it's like all genres. Like I'm playing, you know, like early UK breakbeat, like two bad mice and mm. might go from that to like some old crystal method from nineteen ninety four. Yeah. Or I'm playing like, you know, 
techno house trance drum and bass anything from between like that that 10 year span i have mm. so many files and records and i'm like it's almost like a radio show i'm just like hey here's a here's a song from 1995 <laughs> very cool but saturdays we've been trying to go back to more of like having a guest over and you know actually djing like for real for real but i think w- now that it gets dark here at like 4 30 mm-hmm. um once winter comes in, people kind of hibernate a little bit more around yeah. here yeah. and you find you get a little bit more activity on um, streams and stuff because everyone's kind of home staying in from the cold and the dark. Mm-hmm. Summer is a little harder. Everybody wants to be outside because mm-hmm. summer's so short. So, or if they're off um, of the lake or whatever. Yeah. 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 It's like get out and enjoy it while you can. It doesn't mm-hmm. last long. Right. But winter seems to drag on for a long time around here. You know, you live in the North as well. Yeah. For sure cool well this has been awesome thanks so much for uh chatting and uh yeah i'll put uh put your links in in the notes of the show and cool yeah we'll definitely be in touch thanks for having me tony all right take care thank you for listening to this episode i wanted to tell you about a free gift that i've created for you it's a guide tailored to uh you producers who are trying to do music production around a day job and family responsibilities i call it my release roadmap um, you know, as producers these days, we have a lot of tasks that we have to complete and a lot of hats, hats, hats that we have to wear. Um, and uh, this release roadmap is really a guide that uh, simplifies the workflow of completing and releasing a track from music production to sending, sending demos to labels and then to prom- and then on to promoting the release. Uh, when you implement a system like what I've outlined in uh, this roadmap, all of the tasks become a lot less overwhelming and you have more, more mental energy and time for creating music. You can download this roadmap at tonyfuel.com slash roadmap. Again, that's tonyfuel.com slash roadmap. Thank you for listening and I will see you or hear you in the next episode. Take care.